so friendly. Mm -hmm. Give a warm welcome. My brother, Father Mike Bristol. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor. We were in, uh, we were in the seminary together, Mount St. Mary's. That was a few years ahead. Yeah, he, Monsignor had a career for a little while before that. Um, so, um, yeah, I came into this topic of demons um, kind of through the counseling. Um, I was chaplain at St. Francis Hospital here in Peoria for nine years, and during that time is when I was going to Bradley for a few years, um, getting the master's degree in counseling. And then when I went on for the Ph.D., I, um, a priest I knew who had done exorcisms in another state and uh, talked to him a few times, but what are you, lo- what are you seeing? What are you looking at? And he'd, we'd have some neat conversations about it. So this Regent University where I was going, um, partly out there, partly online, mostly online, um, evangelical, which was really neat, Southern evangelicals there mainly. And one of the instructors, when I pr- said, hey, here's a topic I'm thinking of for dissertation, and when I said that, how Catholic exorcists distinguish between demon possession and mental disorders, his eyes lit up, and he said, I'd love to hear about that. So that's, that's how I'm standing here tonight then with you. Um, so a couple things I'll bring up from so, uh, the rite of exorcism. Make sure you get one and carry it with you. Every- I'm joking. You don't need <laughs> don't ever need to have one. Um, but I'll refer to it a few times. You know, we think of church teaching um, from popes, of course, from the tradition being handed on, um, from catechisms. Um, also from church rituals, if you think about it. You know, the, thing, the prayers we hear at Mass, not only the creed but other prayers, those are, you know, include church teaching. So that's why I can you know, look at the rite of exorcism to see a little bit about what the church teaches about, about the topic of demons. Um, but I want to start with, uh, because that's, uh, I'd really love to write more about mental health and tried, and that one didn't get published, we'll see. Um, about a Catholic approach to mental health. So let me start with a little story about mental health that leads to, uh, you know, the devil made me do it kind of idea. Um, my first name is Mike, so, so as not to implicate anyone else here, we'll call this, this guy driving who's a road rage driver, real road rage, Mike, Mike the road rage driver. Um, so driving along one day, and the usual thing, you know, someone happens to cut him off, he has to hit the brakes. Well, Mike, is, he lays on the horn, lays on the horn, swearing, starts following the car, still rolls down the window swearing, still following them, honking the horn, and way out of hand of what a person should be when someone cuts you off while you're driving. Um, psychology is this, we can define briefly as the study of um, why do we think, feel, and do the things we do. You know, if you think about that, that's psychology. Why did, why did I do that? Why is that person doing that? Why do I think this way? We can call that psychology, trying to find those answers. Why do I feel this way? Why did Mike do that? Why did he feel so enraged? Um, it's neat if you study different cultures and different historical times, pretty much the reasons for why Mike did that um, fall into these five categories. And you can read different cultures. You can read way back in the ancient Greeks. And you can still pretty much say, oh, it falls into one of these categories. Um, so one would be um, maybe the biological. Why did Mike do that? Well, you know, he's, uh, um, whatever, his brain chemistry is a little bit, he doesn't have enough of melatonin or a little bit too much of something else, and so um, he needs to go see a psychiatrist and get some meds to help him relax a little bit. Ancient cultures wouldn't have had the meds, but they would have said maybe the type of food you're eating or maybe some herbs might help. So they had the same idea, even if they weren't exactly doing the same things. So that's one reason we might, and these, by the way, are not mutually exclusive. These are actually all things that do in, you know, influence the way we think and, and feel and, and act. So there's one. The, the, we could call that the biological medical model. Um, a second one is cognitive thinking. So... Um, what, what's that about? Well, I guess Mike, uh, he, he goes around all day thinking angry thoughts, getting, you know, and keeps those in his head. Well, naturally, when some little thing happens, it's going to, uh, it's going to affect how he reacts. So he needs to change his attitude. That's, that would be the uh, cognitive one. Uh, the behavioral one would say, well, you know, he's just been doing that, and he needs to change. So maybe he needs to, uh, if he were to come to me as a counselor and I were doing the behavioral model, I might say, well, hey, you might get a ticket. You might get in a wreck. You know, think about the, the actual behavioral, physical consequences of what you're doing. Why do we have a kid stand in the corner? Why do we put an adult in jail? Partly to protect society, but partly, hey, here is the, the actual consequence. The idea of being changed the behavior and, you know, personal start changing on their own after they've gone through that. Okay, we're getting bored. We need demons here. All right. Um, then there's one more that we could say a Catholic approach to mental health would be this one, um, existential. And that one is, uh, 
I guess a couple questions how, of, of what, is the, what is the meaning of life? How do I want to live my life? Um, am, I, am I the person I want to be? And if not, how do I get there? So if he came to me as a priest, that's the kind of thing I would talk to him in a Catholic context. You know, you could have an existentialist, could be an atheist, and would still ask those questions if you were a counselor. But since I'm a priest, I'd say, well, well you're asking me as a priest? Hey, let's talk about your faith. And, and by the way, part of it is going to be, you know, is that the way to act as a good Catholic? No, okay. So existential means existence, your whole thing. So those are four models of uh, why we do and act, act. What did I say? Think, feel, and act the way we do. The last one, the devil. The devil made me do it. That's why he did it, because he's possessed. Probably not. Um, but that's not a new one either. Cultures and throughout the world and cultures through history have seen certain reactions and thinking, that's, that's a devil, uh, you know, or more than one. Some kind of evil spirit, something like that is causing that. Um, that somewhat changed uh, with Freud, who was uh, really, uh, yeah, he had problems. Um, so, um, so well, but he's in some way tr- kind of made that, oh, we're not going to blame sp- evil spirits and, and demons. That's all ancient. I'm Freud, and we're the late 1800s, and we're going to change that. And now it's, now it's the id and the ego and superego and uh, all this stuff. Basically saying the same thing, only putting in, more, making it more nonsense and changing the wording. In other words, what, what, if a demon is doing it, what is that? Well, it's some dark, mysterious force out of my control that's compelling me to do something. What did Freud say the unconscious was? It's basically some dark, mysterious force compelling me to do things. So he, he just changed the wording and made it more foolish, and so there we are with that. Um, that's called, uh, uh, what do they call it, psychodynamic. I don't spend much time on it. Um, but that's basically, it's kind of interesting that that's a rehashing of, uh, of the idea that demons influence how we act. Um, the Catholic existential one, so the Catholic approach to mental health, would, would look at... Um, if we want to look at the, the negatives, why do I do things that I don't want to do? You know, such as this guy who comes in, Mike, the road rage driver, who came to talk to me and said, I, I do that. Why do I do that? Well, we can look at some things. Um, original sin, you know, we all have inclinations toward doing things wrong. Um, all, all have, we're all disordered uh, ever since Adam and Eve committed sin. Everyone, of course, except Jesus and Mary. So we can partially, we don't want to say it's all original sin, I'm, my background is half Irish, half Italian. I like to throw, well, what do you expect? Half Irish, half Italian. He's all over the place. That's a weak excuse. So, um, but we can, you know, we, all, we know we are disordered by original sin. Um, we're, we are disordered by the sins of others as well. You know, definitely growing up, d- parents aren't perfect. Some are better than others. You get someone who's really treated very badly as parents. It's real hard to to bounce back from that. Um, the hospital where I am, not, not too many hospitals have an inpatient mental health unit, but ours does, which is really neat, especially since it's a, a small hospital. Um, but so many times I meet the people who are there for inpatient, and that means things have gotten pretty serious, where they go to the hospital emergency room, and it means they're, you know, about to, they're threatening their own life or someone else's, basically. Um, and so many of those people, they'll talk about some really bad stuff they went through as a child, and now they've got, you know, now they're uh, struggling with drugs or alcohol oftentimes. So um, definitely uh, we've got original sin, got the sins of others, both growing up and currently, you know. Maybe we're around some people now at work who are really doing some bad things to us and making it really difficult, make our lives difficult. Maybe Mike had that at work all day, and that's why he was driving, you know, so badly. Um, he could partly blame that maybe. So we've got original sin, the sins of others, oh, and our own sins, our own choices. So when someone's at the, you know, at the hospital, the mental health unit, yeah, I get it. I'm sorry to hear that. You know, right now it sounds like you're choosing you know, maybe drugs or alcohol or some other thing to, to deal with that. Let's talk about some other ways to do that. Those, you know, those aren't good. So we definitely have our own sins too. And, uh, and then we really do have the devil. Um, so... We'll talk about the, what the devil is then. Um, fallen angel, of course, right? Um, you know, when the beginning of the Bible says that we are, human beings are made in the image of God, um, and we're the only ones named in all of the physical creation that are the image of God. I'm going to bring this up in these days, and, um, you know, I, I like dogs. I was going to say as much as the next person. Probably not because I, I don't have one because they're too much work. Um, but I was fine when I was in the rectory, and the other priest said, well, good, I get a dog around. I like a dog, but I'm not going to take care of it. He, it's his dog. Um, so, but some people are really attached to animals. Say, "Oh no, they're all you know, very human." Okay, well, 
um, to do the existential type thing or the Catholic thing. No dog gets up. You know, I just talked about Mike, the road rage, road, road rage driver. His, he might wake up in the morning and say, all right, this is the day. I'm going to work harder at this. I'm going to, uh, I, I'm, I know I'm not going to be able to do it all overnight, but I'm really going to start following those counseling tips and relaxing and this and that. Okay, dogs don't do that. No dog wakes up. You know, this is the day I'm going to be a better dog. And they don't, you know, they don't have that capacity. They, you know, they're, they're a mixture of their instincts and experiences and, and training, but they don't have that, that uh, will that we have. So... Made in the image of God, um, human beings have intellect and will. Intellect is our ability to think abstractly in a way animals can't. Um, will is able to choose good and evil. Animals can't. Your dog, dog bites me, the dog doesn't you know, get arrested and cuffed and put on trial. The owner might, but not the dog. So we recognize that human beings have intellect and will. The only other creatures we know of, unless there are ETs out there somewhere, um, would be angels. God also made angels in his image, meaning intellect and will. So they also have that ability to think, you know, abstractly um, that human beings have. And they also had, still have the ability to choose, um, but, no, but um, their choice was a one-time thing, to choose good or evil. That's why they're, you know, the, right from the beginning, um, Th- St. Thomas Aquinas, who I'll quote a few times, I think, um, he's, he's always the go-to. You can always look to him for a good explanation. If you can understand him, and I'm, not hot, and I'm not that great in philosophy, so I struggle with him, but he's always good. So um, um, I'm sorry, just off my topic with St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, but the angels um, with their intellect and will. So, oh, right, he would say right after the moment of their creation, they don't have to read up, they don't have to study, they don't have to think things through. God infused them with knowledge, so right away they kind of could make their decision. Do you want to be obedient, subservient to God and um, heaven or not? And those who chose yes are happy forever. Those who chose no are unhappy forever. So we've got the, the good angels and the, and the demons. Um, I love this part. St. Thomas, I'm paraphrasing, but um, okay, well, the angels, the good ones are in heaven, but we also we just, we just had the feast day of the guardian angels a couple days ago, so they're also somehow present on earth for us. Um, the demons are in hell, but somehow they're present, so at least some of them are on earth, causing trouble for us, tempting us and all that. Um, how can they be in, you know, where are they? So I guess that's the first question is, what are angels? They're pure spirits, of course, um, with intellect and will. So there's question one about what are angels and demons, therefore. Um, the second question, where are they? As I said, well, the good ones are kind of in heaven and earth. The bad ones are in hell and earth. How does that work? Uh, St. Thomas says a couple things about that. One is he would say, well, since they're not physical, we don't want to think of them in a place. Well, there's one hanging out right behind that. You know, no, they're not that kind of in that place that way. He would say that we can say an angel or a devil is in the place where it is exerting its power. So if my guardian angel is protecting me from some spiritual or physical harm right now, we can say, okay, he's present here, not as a physical being, but he's exerting his power here, um, which is why we can also maybe say, oh, he's, if not at the same moment, but very close to the same moment in heaven adoring God, because that's what he's doing almost the same time. Maybe not exactly the same time, but so instantaneous that when we do artwork, we show angels with wings, right, to show they can move quickly. We also show them, I, my first name being Michael, so I love the you know, artwork of Michael, you know, um, stomping on the devil, maybe with a sword or a, uh, you know, a spear or something. Um, I, you know, for someone who kind of likes creepy things and stuff, hardly anything creepier than those, uh, the cherub image of angels, little head, baby heads with wings sticking out of them. I find those extremely creepy. Um, but I get the symbolism. Um, uh, the head meaning that's where our intellect is, right, our brain. So it's showing that they're, you know, they're not an animal. They're, they've got an you know, intellect and will. Um, a baby meaning their perfect purity, you know, the good angels never sinned. And again, the wings showing that they can move instantaneously. It's still creepy, though, to see a little baby head with wings. Um, oh, but the really, uh, really cool thing that uh, I like that St. Thomas said about um, 
the angels on earth and the devils on earth. So is, if an angel's down here, is it kind of like, man, I wish I could be back in heaven? No, he says they're perfectly happy here. Why? Because angels can always see that God's will is being done perfectly. Even on earth, they say, God, whatever happens, good, bad, it's all part of God's plan. They know it's God of God's plan, and they love God's will, and so they're perfectly content on earth, looking at, hey, God's will is being done here on earth just as it is in heaven. They're perfectly happy here on earth. As they are. So he said, uh, basically, they take heaven with them when they come to earth. Devils take hell with them when they come to earth. They hate God's will. And so in hell, they hate God's will, but they're smart enough to know God's will is always done. And even if we sin and whatever things go wrong in the world, they're smart enough to know God's wins in the end, and they hate that. And when they come to earth, they still hate that. They still know, even though they have these little victories here on earth, they're, yeah, this and that, and tempting people to sin and succeeding, whatever, they still know in the end, God's will overall is done. God's plan will, will take place at the end. They know that and they hate that. So they're still miserable. They bring hell with them, as St. As Thomas would say. The good angels bring heaven with them to earth. The bad angels bring hell with them. Because otherwise it would be like, hey, you're both here. Aren't you both kind of the same, feeling the same about it? Not at all. Two different, completely different things. Um, do you want to uh, give me a time update, maybe at 7.20, 7.40? Can we do that? What, what is it now? It's uh, 54, 64. Or, I'm sorry, I meant, okay, so we're about half an hour. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe about maybe about 7.15. I forgot when we started. Okay, so... Um, um, getting into the... The right of exorcism, I guess, then. Um, the most common way that demons act in our lives, of course, is temptation. And I, and I would put out there that's the most dangerous is temptation. Um, what did the devil do in the Garden of Eden? Which, think of, oh, poor Adam and Eve. Can you think? I don't know if they knew that the whole fate of all billions of human beings was on them at that moment. I, 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 that would tear, I feel for Adam and Eve. That is a terrifying thought that what you do here is going to affect all of humanity for, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of years or whatever. So how does the devil, what's he going to do, possess them? No. Little whispering serpent. Hey, you see that? Go ahead and take it. No, God said not to. No, no, it's going to be fine. Take it. So that little whispering serpent, I think it hasn't changed much since then. That's the most dangerous, in my mind, more so than whatever else the devil does, is that just that little whispering voice, go ahead, no, it'll be all right. No, God, yeah, never mind him. Um, That's how the devil mostly works, right? That's the ordinary activity of the devil. But when we say that, we don't want to make it sound like ordinary, so it's no big deal. Temptation is huge. And, And... we don't want to also think, though, that the devil is the only source of temptation. You familiar with that? We would say um, the flesh and the world and the devil. So uh, the flesh would be things with our body. So, you know, sins against purity, drugs and alcohol, gluttony, um, whatever, laziness, anything involving our body, those temptations we have, those would be temptations of the flesh. Um, temptations of the world, I think we can almost boil it down to two, power and popularity. Um, You might say material things. That's true. I guess I think that's so connected maybe to power or or to... uh or to the body, you know, if I want all these luxuries or something. But uh, power and popularity, never underestimate those temptations. Why does that person do that? Why do they want so much power? Why do they need so much control? Th- um, there's no, there doesn't need any further answer. A person wants power because they like power. A person wants control because they like control. And we all do, by the way, but we have to rein it in, of course. That's humility. Um, how much power and control am I supposed to have and how much am I not? Um, and then popularity. You know, who doesn't want to have a few people who like them? Who, who wants to have everyone hate them? No one. So again, perfectly fine. But the temptation is to go with the latest fad. And all you... Oh, wow. Look around our culture and you look, how can people just run off and do that? Some of the, the sexual things that have happened in just in the last 10 years are like, but people weren't saying that. Barack Obama, when he ran for president the first time, was, I'm in favor of traditional marriage, man and woman. Wow, that changed in four years, didn't it? So now that's a hateful thing to say. And but, well, but you just said that, and he sure wasn't alone that change flipped out like that. Um, the counseling profession that I'm sort of part of, I'm a licensed counselor. That I've just just since I first started the classes have in 2000. I was here 2006 to 2009. Wow, has that gone a, a long way? So um, why is that? Well, once it catches on. And it's a popular thing to do. You don't want to be left behind, right? Oh, you're going to be old-fashioned Christian. Oh, no, no, I want to be up with things. So beware of those. Um, not only the devil. I picture those as uh, 
you know, the two main ones, the, the temptations of the flesh and the world, and then the devil, I think, of the serpent. Or I do like the images of the devil. You know, we can laugh at uh, the devil being uh, like in tights and red tights and a pitchfork. Um, I love the pitchfork idea because what does he do most of the time? Where's your weak point? He jabs at it, you know, whether it's popularity or, or you know, power or, you know, drugs, alcohol. Where's your weak point? And he watches us. The devils can see us, right? They can, they can watch us all the time, and they don't forget. It's not like a devil. What did he? I forgot. Devils don't do that. Their, their intellect is spiritual, so it's, it's, they don't forget things. Um, so they do jab at us. Plus, I do like the idea of... Uh, the devil mocks God, so I do like the idea of putting the, in artwork the devil in red uh, you know, spandex because it's a way of mocking him, I think. So, and he mocks God, as we'll see, so it's good to mock him sometime. Um, so, um, so temptation, the main problem of the devil. And the church has really talks about temptation a lot, right, including of the devil. Um, uh, the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's talking about the devil, too. And then um, the other extreme, the most extraordinary and most rare, would be demon possession. And that pretty much means what it sounds like. The devil, the devil or, or the exorcists say, I've never, I've never seen signs that I thought were possession, unnatural things, and um, never done an exorcism. If a priest, you know, someone calls and says, hey, can you come and see my family member, my friend, whatever, and the priest, oh my gosh, that shouldn't be happening, uh, you know, defies the laws of nature. The priest can then call the bishop's office and say, well, I think we've got a problem here, and then the bishop can appoint someone to do an exorcism. That's, that's how a priest is an exorcist, the bishop appoints someone. It's kind of like, um, it, it's not, you know, the movies make it almost seem like a special power. It's not. It's more like an appointment, like, oh, I'm pastor at Utica and chaplain of at uh, St. Elizabeth's and Monsignor Brownsy is uh, pastor here and chaplain here too, right? You're considered chaplain? Yeah, so those are appointments. A bishop can also say, okay, and I appoint you, you know, exorcist. So it's an appointment. It's not like a special power. It's an appointment, and then you've got the power of the church to do it, of course. Um, so demon possession um, means literally a demon taking possession of a person's body and moving, having control of their body, moving it, including moving their vocal cords. So... Um, The right of exorcism was promulgated. That's kind of a word for published, but it, more, more particularly, it means um, put out as an official document of the church, an official book of the church. So it was promulgated, the right of exorcism, in 1614. If you think about it, oh, that's like 100 and some years after the, the printing press. So it's not like this was just came out of nowhere. It was being passed on in verbal form um, for, uh, for centuries, and there may have been changes here and there, but a lot of it just from what we read in the gospel is pretty similar. And, um, but anyway, 1614 is when it became the current form, except for part of it added at the end, which I'll get to in a few minutes. There are three parts of the, of the rite of exorcism. The first part is some instructions. So if that sounds funny, it's really it's very uh, instructive. Um, I encourage priests to look at it just because it's instructive about demons. And I'm going to quote a couple things here and about exorcism. Um, Second part of the rite of exorcism is the rite of exorcism, the one you think of when the exorcist is driving a demon out of a person. The third part was just added in 1890 by Pope Leo XIII, and um, kind of for a, more for a place or a thing. So um, haunted house, you know, um, not that we believe in a, a you know. Aunt Molly came back to hang around or something like that. If, I think most haunted house things are probably people's imagination and emotions running away with them. However, again, one of these things that throughout history and throughout all different cultures, um, enough people have said that they thought a certain place had something um, that's unexplainable by the laws of nature happening. Well, I'm willing to believe that that must happen sometimes. Even though I've never seen it, I'll take their word for it. Um, but I don't believe it's some dead person or, some, or they'll t- talk about a dead animal coming back. The devil can do those things. Remember, he's purely spirit, but he can you know, move around quickly can move objects, uh, appear as who knows what. Um, so anytime that if there, you really saw something that's, wow, that, hey, that looks like so-and-so, that's a haunted house. Um, depending what we mean by haunted, I would say, oh, if you really saw something, that was the devil. Um, it was not a dead person coming back to hang out there. And one that really annoys me, it seems to be a popular thing with those who are into that topic um, of, a haunting taking place where a child died, especially if a t- child died tragically, and they hang around. And I've had people even ask me, like, well, I, you know, 
Okay, well, let's think this through. If you have some kind of Christian background, what do you think God does with the soul of a, of a child who has died? Do you really want to, do you believe, and if they're not Catholic, do you really believe in a God that consigns that, that child to wander around? I can't think of any worse belief, and I would never hold such a belief. So, no, that's, uh, maybe the devil likes to go places where a child died tragically. I don't know. He's, who knows what the devil wants? Bad things. But no, no, no child is, God leaving a child to wander around. That's terrible. Um, definitely not true. Okay, so how do you know if, back to the topic of the dissertation, the topic of the book, how do you know if a person's possessed? And keep the, the instru- uh, instructors, the dissertation committee, the, we, I had one Catholic um, person on it and uh, two non-Catholic, and the non-Catholics in particular were imp- impressed that way back in 1614, the Catholic Church would say something like this. To the exorcist, especially he, he meaning the exorcist, especially he should not believe too readily that a person is possessed by an evil spirit, but he ought to ascertain the signs by which a person possessed can be distinguished from one who is suffering from melancholy or some other illness. Melancholy, uh, Latin melancholia, you know, it means kind of sad. That would have been a catch-all phrase for mental illness, psychological problems. So they were impressed to hear, really, in 1614, the church was already saying, don't jump at this, you know, presuming that this is a demon. Um, Look for the signs that distinguish it from psychological problems. Okay, what are those signs? So signs of possession are the following. Remember, the devil likes to mock God, right? Um, ability to speak with some, there are three. Ability to speak with some facility in a strange tongue or understand it when spoken by another. Um, what does that remind us of something good that God did? Pentecost, okay? So the apostles could speak in preaching the praises of God. Um, when a person is possessed, um, and again, I'm not seeing it, but I am certain that they are not going to be praising God with the things they're saying. They're going to be blaspheming, swearing, saying who knows what kind of bad things. So, um, but they're going to do some things in another, they can do some things in another language. How is that? Again, keep in mind, Satan, a pure intellect, uh, or a pure spirit, he's got an intellect. It's easy, as easy for him to know English as it is to know whatever, you name it. Swahili, one of the, one of the African priests I work with at uh, St. Francis spoke Swahili. Um, you know, you name the ancient Hebrew, um, Latin. So a person starts speaking a language that they shouldn't know, oh, sign of possession. Of course, exorcists would have to be careful to find out, well, wait a minute, did this person study Latin in college or high school, or did they learn Spanish wherever else? So you'd want to be careful to look into the background and find out, did this person, does this person know this language? So you'd have to be careful with that, that sign. But that's a mockery of, of the, the speaking of tongues that the apostles did at Pentecost. Um, a second s- sign. The faculty of divulging distant and hidden events. So the person um, starts telling me um, uh, something about my past that they shouldn't know. Okay, I've never met the, that's That's the one exorcist told me. He said, that's the, if you hear that, that's pretty definite. You know, you're dealing with this person, he said, and they start telling you some things. They don't, I don't know them, never laid eyes on this person, and now they're telling me things about my past. Pretty clear cut. Something is seriously wrong here. Um, but the devil knows what I did in the past. Um, it's interesting. Exorcists say there are gaps in their knowledge, though. So I guess one demon isn't watching me maybe my whole life, um, maybe doing different things, but would know some things about my past and be able to throw them out at me if I were the one doing the exorcism. Um, distant events. Um, exorcisms so, uh, oftentimes take more than one time. The exorcist will meet with a person a number of days. Um, so suppose the exorcist says something and... Um, you know, telling me something that's happening, I find out that night, oh my gosh, he knew what happened today, wherever, a car wreck 100 miles away or something. How did this person standing here, they were with me when that, when that thing happened. Oh, d- uh, the devil could see it happening. He knew it was happening. Devils and angels are not like God. They're not everywhere at once. They don't know everything. But again, they can move around and know more than we can. Um, so that's the second. Um, oh, and by the way, what would that be a mockery of? Um, I would say of... Uh, Maybe a prophecy, you know, and, and some certain saints who have had uh, visions and things like that. Um, Padre Pio able to read souls, that, that kind of thing. Some knowledge, you know, that um, the prophets were able to, you know, Old Testament prophets, tell about things that were happening or were going to happen. How did they do that? Well, God gave them the knowledge. Well, the devil mocks that. He can't really, and this is an important point, um, if you uh, 
know someone who goes to a, a psychic or palm reader or whatever happens to be the latest popular thing of someone telling the future. A crystal ball, I don't know if anyone really does that now. Um, a Ouija board. Um, the devil cannot really see the future. Only God can. That's very clear. Just like the devil can't, you know, only God can read the heart and mind. The devil doesn't, can't read my mind. Um, but, you know, let's say you get a husband and wife who are together for a long time, and they can tell by tone of voice, facial expression, bodily, what's wrong? I can tell. Wow, how'd you know that? Well, they've been observing each other for decades. Devil's smarter and can observe and doesn't forget. So, um, even though he can't read our mind or heart, he can sometimes almost make it look like it, maybe. Um, and same thing with telling the future. Okay, suppose uh, I suppose I'm you know got on my calendar to um, go to some event tomorrow, and uh, someone else is going to be at the event too, and they go to a psychic, and the psychic says, "You are going to go there, and you're going to see this priest, uh, Father Mike Driscoll, blah blah." blah. Um, and it turns out to be true. Oh, my gosh, the psychic was, well, most of the psychic stuff is nonsense, of course. It's vague and whatever. But if any of it turned out to be true, it would be probably just a, uh, very rare. I've never seen this happen, but I believe it could. Devil look, knows my schedule. Devil knows that person's schedule. Can tell If that person goes to psychic, can maybe whisper to the psychic or whatever, yeah, here's what's going to happen. They're going to meet this person. Not that it was definite. Maybe I was going to get the flu, and then that prediction would be false. So it's not, a, um, it's not seeing the future. The devil's making a very good prediction of the future. You know, maybe a really, really, really good weatherman. You know, a really good weatherman can look at all these forces and say, tomorrow, 5 p.m., it's going to start raining. The devil can maybe make predictions like that, looking at the different things and saying, it looks like this is what's going to happen. And it can uh, look that way to a gullible person who's doing something they shouldn't be doing, um, consulting someone like that. So... So, and I bring that up because the faculty of divulging um, um, distant and hidden events, I'm reading the Latin, and my Latin's not perfect, but that uh, another translation is future and hidden events. So whatever it is, the devil giving this person knowledge they shouldn't have. If you see that, you think, oh, that person must be possessed. Third one is the most vague in my mind. Um, it's good that it's there. <laughs> display of powers which are beyond the subject's age and natural condition. Powers meaning physical. So, if you, and I'm not necessarily recommending the movie The Exorcist or some of these other movies. It is interesting in the movie The Exorcist, they covered all these bases. The, the young girl who was possessed uh, started responding and blaspheming in Latin. And um, she talked about something in the priest's life that had happened just recently that she should not have known. And then she, a uh, uh, famous scene, uh, she turns her head all the way around. Is everyone familiar with that movie, The Exorcist? I don't recommend it. Um, no, there are a couple of bad parts that shouldn't be watched. But, um, but that was a classic horror movie scene, maybe still is, that she turns her head around. I've talked to a number of exorcists, and none of them ever seen it happen, so uh, I think that's just Hollywood. Um, but she also, in the movie, levitated off of the bed. And um, a, a, one exorcist said, no, I've not seen that, but he said, I've heard a couple others say that does. So I guess that does happen. More, I think, they talk about great strength. And that is very, very, anyone who's been, I've been a hospital chaplain 15 years. Anyone who's been uh, working in the emergency room for some time or the mental health floor, you can have a small person, uh, like a, I'm thinking of like right now, I remember a small young woman who was in several times, God bless her, just, I don't know what her past was, horribly, I'm sure, hurt. When she is out of control, when a human being doesn't care about hurting themselves or someone else, it would usually take four good-sized guys to hold, one holding down each arm, one holding down each leg, and strap her down to this thing and give her a shot to calm her down. It totally breaks your heart to see it. Um, but she wasn't possessed. That was not demon possession. I saw her once at Walmart, and she was so sweet. Oh, it just it was so neat, and it so broke your heart to see how she was in that other um, situation. So um, she was not possessed. Um, so that one can be tricky. Um, although here's one, a little bit disgusting, but a priest said this is one thing that convinced him this person was possessed, that um, he had, uh, um, the, the right specifically says the priest should not have the Eucharist with him in such a way that the person is going to grab it and desecrate the Eucharist. But he thought he was doing the exor an exorcism, 
and he's just done a few, and he said he thought it would be helpful to have them in the church with the Blessed Sacrament on the altar and a monstrance. You know, everyone know what that is, a gold cross that, you know, you can see the body of Christ. And a little bit gross, but he said the, the person, uh, male or female, don't know, was some distance away, and he said with spitting, spitting farther and more accurate, and then, like, they had someone, whoever was assisting him, like, move the monstrance, and the person was still able to spit distance and hit the... He said it was too, it was too far. Yeah, I know, you look disgusted. <laughs> I know, but so that kind of thing would be a physical thing. You're like, that's, that's not right, you know. Um, who, who practices that much to be able to do that? So um, that, that was one of the things. And they, they tell me, the exorcists tell me, um, they don't want just one, one thing or one instance of th- something because they could be mistaken. So it's like, show me the money a little bit. They, um, they, trying to follow the ritual. He should not believe too readily a person is possessed by an evil spirit. Um, Oh, and um, what's my example of that? So that's uh, what, um, what would we say is, uh, how is that a mockery of something God does? I would say, you know, we could pick, pick any number of things. It could be a mockery of uh, Jesus walking on water, which is something a human being couldn't naturally do. Any physical healing, you know, that, that uh, Jesus or, or any of the saints of, you know, whoever has done a miraculous physical healing, um, that's not something that, um, that's a, something that is, power outside of a subject's age or condition. Um, and certain saints have levitated too. We just had the feast day of Joseph of Cupertino. Um, a number of people had seen him levitate. So, um, but again, he was praising God when he did it, not blaspheming or whatever. So those are th- three conditions. And then the opening for my dissertation was, and various other, because one instructor said, well, this thing's been around, f- you know, 500, 600 years or whatever, 500 years. Um, there might not much be to say about it. Various other indications, which when taken together as a whole, pile up the evidence. That leaves an opening for the judgment of the exorcist. And so a bishop appoints someone who he trusts, and the exorcist can say, and, so, and this is if I had a finding in my dissertation, and if there's anything in my book that was a finding, it's really not much. It was noticing the wide range in Catholic exorcists, because I, I got a chance to talk to, not a lot, but a handful. And um, kind of, uh, as I said in my book, I think I called it the narrow approach and the wide approach. I've talked to like one exorcist who would say, well, you know, if, if all at once a person's finances go bad and uh, their uh, marriage breaks up and uh, something, you know, they start to have a serious health problem, he'd say, I start to wonder what my uh, undergrad degree was uh, economics. So right away I think, well, wait a minute here, and now I've got the counseling background. Um, during a recession, people have strains on their finances in addition to strains on their relationships and maybe health problems, too, from the stress. So I'm, I follow more of the exorcists um, who would be more narrow approach. They're saying, show me some one of these and show me more than one of these. I want to see something outside the laws of nature or I'm not going to think that this is a demon possession. Oh, thank you. Okay, we're doing pretty well here. Um, I'd plan to go for about an hour, and then if there's discussion or questions, that would be great. Um, the church, so the church has those two. I'm going to get back to that. Um, yeah, I'll get back to that in a minute. The church has those two, um, temptation and possession. The church doesn't really define anything in between, even though we know there is something in between. Who's uh, St. John Vianney? A lot of people heard of the patron saint of parish priests. Uh, fairly recent, 1800s in France. And uh, a number of people who had uh, been around him in his lifetime who w- um, apparently he'd be in his room and they'd just hear like loud noises and whatever and he's getting kind of just beat up. It's like the devil can't touch this guy. He was in such a, you know, he was such a devout and holy priest um, that uh, I guess the devil just took to just beating up on him. Literally, physically, he would do that and trash his room and things like that. Same thing we think of that could happen in a haunted house um, was being done to John Vianney. Some exorcists and some others in the church would call that um, uh, oppression. That's not an official church term. So if you're ever around someone talking about this, oh, a clear case of oppression. No, it's not a clear case because the church doesn't define it. We just say, yes, sometimes that seems to happen. Uh, What is it? Well, he wasn't possessed, certainly, but it was more than just a temptation. It was some kind of, I've heard some exorcists say attachment. That's as good a word as any. Just something in between there. The devil's acting in an extraordinary way. The other one would be um, obsession. So if, if, uh, if oppression is something from the outside, getting literally beat up um, or getting you know, things trashed around them or whatever. I've had a couple people, and again, I've never seen the proof, but um, one, 
woman I would talk to, I met her a couple times and talked to her on the phone, but she said even though she moved uh, you know, several times in her life, there was always some dark figure that was always there kind of talking to her and when she was younger. She was kind of like friends with her or whatever. Uh, I don't know if she had, I didn't know her well enough to know what her mental s- problems were. She seemed very coherent. Could that be? Sure. That could be some kind of, it wasn't possession, but maybe more than a temptation. Maybe a devil, maybe she'd opened herself to the devil sometime and he kind of liked hanging around her to make things, see if he could get her to get her worse. Um, you might meet people with, I've seen it with alcohol, where people just say it just feel you know, they want so badly to quit drinking, an alcoholic for years, and just see, as much as they want to stop, just seem to be unable. And I've had people like that say, it's got to be the devil. And I always say, oh, I'm sure it is. Part of it. Remember those four different kinds of sin. Original sin, I'll bring those up. And the sins of others, what happened in your past, and maybe you have a natural inclination, and your own, you know, your own bad choices at some point. Yeah, I'm sure the devil's another one. So, okay. Um, a couple of young women over the years um, that I met with anorexia, a couple times it was uh, just the way they put it, just kind of like, oh, gosh, that, yeah, do I think the devil was involved? Sure, just the way they said, it's that voice, that voice telling me you should die. Why don't you starve to death? Look what you're doing to yourself. Look at your family. Why don't you? It's like, oh, gosh, they're just both, two different, totally different occasions, totally different people, but both times it just sounded like, wow, they really sounded like they were repeating something they had heard. So possessed, no. So it wouldn't break out the right of exorcism. Worse than a temptation? Yeah, it seemed like it. Worse than the usual temptations that I feel. You know, that was pretty dramatic the way they described it. And both had been, you know, uh, you know serious health problems from, from uh, eating disorders. So there's some in-between ground between um, um, temptation and possession that the church recognizes but doesn't define. Um, the right goes on to say that um, how is that one worded? That's kind of neat the way it's worded. Um, again, when it says he, it's talking about the exorcist. He shall command the devil to tell whether he is detained in that body by, um, and I'm going to do my own translating. Um, uh, the translation, and this is not an official translation, this is what some, uh, I don't know if he was a priest or whoever did a translation, that's fine, but it's nothing official about it. From So he says, necromancy, evil signs or amulets. But if we look at Latin, maybe a little bit more detailed, we can see the mockery of God. I like pointing that out. The devil is bad, he's really bad, and this is what he likes to do, mock God. Um, so he can be detained in a body three ways. Operam magicum. What's that? Operam operations. Works of magic. Um, this translation says necromancy, um, which because that means, what's necromancy? Talking to the dead. Oh, well, wait a minute. We should talk to the dead. We should ask our saints for prayers. We should pray for the souls in purgatory. This is a mockery of that. Talking to the dead through a Ouija board, uh, doing a spell, um, whatever, whatever. Uh, so uh, works, works of magic means um, Wicca, witchcraft, whatever way I think I'm saying things that I'm going to be controlling uh, the world, the elements, uh, my love life, whatever the case may be, um, as opposed to it's a mockery of prayer. If you think of it, it's the exact opposite of prayer. Trying to do a magic spell so that I can control things, if I just say the right thing, I, this will happen as I want it. Prayer is the exact opposite. Prayer is, I'm not in control. God, you are. Will you please do this? So it's an act of humility as opposed to an act of pride. So the devil, of course, prideful, and, and that's a mockery. So um, he, the, the exorcist is supposed to try, find out, command the devil to tell whether he's detained. So I guess the, the exorcist might command the person, you know, to the devil possessing this person. Um, how did you enter them? Did, was it through some kind of spells, magic, whatever you were trying to do? All that stuff is nonsense, of course. There aren't, it's not like there are real magic spells out there. It's all nonsense. Now, the devil might toy with the person. You know, hey, you know, you're getting involved in witchcraft. Hey, it's starting to work. Wow, these spells really work. No, they don't. They're gibberish. They're nonsense. The devil is toying with you, though, maybe, if it seems to be working. Oh, well, great. He's getting a grip on you. He can make those things happen and leave you, you know, the fool there thinking that you're doing it. He's actually doing it to, to pull you away from God and make you think you're, you know, doing whatever you're trying to accomplish. Um, so, op- opera magicum, malefica senia, uh, malefica, evil, evil signs. Um, those would be um, maybe uh, rituals. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Human rituals uh, tend to be this, uh, a lot of the same things 
they can look the same even if they're drastically different. An altar, well, Satanists use an altar and so do we. Um, a chalice, uh, I think they, Satanists, witchcraft, I think they like to use a chalice, so do we. So some incense, you know, burning of certain plants. So some of the things look the same. Again, that's the mockery, though. We're doing those things offering sacrifices to God. You know, they're doing it to offer sacrifice to who knows what or where or whatever, whether it be, you know, Satan or some other false god or something like that. So um, that's the second thing the the exorcist is supposed to ask if the person is detained by, were you doing some kind of rituals, you know, some kind of evil rituals, a mockery of the sacraments. And malefica instrumenta, um, and that was evil instruments, so evil things. And I would think of maybe like a Ouija board or something like that, but clearly the ritual means something smaller, like a charm or an amulet or some, you know, some little crystal, something like that that you think is giving you power or that you've, whatever, a witch or a Satanist, whatever they would want to use little things. Why do I say little things? It had to be fairly small because, after it says the evil signs or amulets, if the one possessed has taken the latter by mouth, so it can't be a Ouija board, I presume. <laughs> You're not going to... Oh. Um, uh, gross, okay. He should be made to vomit them. So um, if he is concealed on his person, he should expose them. When discovered, they must be burned. So, yeah, you get some... If you ever were to come across something like that that you thought was an evil thing, just burn it. Um, when I talked about the, the wide approach and narrow approach... The exorcist, uh, like one I'm thinking of, that I'd read his book, and he was talking... And he seemed to be too quick, I think, to see demon possession... And he would talk about this and make sure, he said, you wash your hands with holy water if you ever touch one of the, well, the ritual just says, just burn the thing, you know, just get rid of it, burn it. Um, so I wouldn't give, another exorcist who I follow more said, no, you don't want to give too much power to those things. Again, what is it? It's a nothing. Now, there is some truth, though, that the devil seems to attach himself to certain people if they're doing these bad things, uh, certain places, who knows why, maybe bad things were done there, and certain things. Again, if you, whatever, a person's trying to use it for evil, or, or in some mockery of God, maybe the devil will attach to it. That's why the ritual says, just you know, burn it, get rid of it. Um, so those are um, those are ways that uh, the devil can, uh, you know, maybe possess a person through those those doors. Exorcists also have uh, pretty much unanimous. The ones I've talked to have said those kind of things. They've also said habits. Or no, what about uh, um, more than just. Uh, habits of, of mortal sin, but even really, I'm trying to think of a word I've heard sometime, but, um, but really embracing a mortal sin, you know, something that's seriously wrong and you're just embracing it, like I have no desire to try and break out of this. Um, I don't know how often that really ends in possession, probably extremely rarely because I see a lot of our culture, unfortunately, misguided, mixed up people and whatever, rejecting Christ and really embracing serious sins and making a lifetime of it, and most of them don't end up possessed. So, um, I believe that that can be a door, but it just doesn't seem to happen too often at all. Um, still a very bad thing to have those habits of serious sin. That's the thing. I sometimes I wonder if the devil would say, I am not touching that. They're on their way to hell. I don't want to mess that up. I've got a good thing going here, I'm going to hell. Um, and the other one, and this one is maybe the hardest for me when, uh, again, I'm citing now a couple things that a number of exorcists have said going away from the ritual. So this is opinion. Um, and uh, that is um, like uh, trauma, abuse, some of those things. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You're talking about someone who's been hurt badly, and now they're, you know. And they said, well, it's not that maybe so much as um, what follows, which is um, uh, holding on to anger, revenge, hate, negative emotions. Oh, that's why Jesus was so adamant about you've got to forgive. You've got to try to forgive. Forgiveness, by the way, this is huge. I'd love to write a book, but I don't have enough to say about it. But um, forgiveness is huge. Um, but it's not, it's not done because it, it's not unusual for people to come to priests, you know. I'm really trying to, and sometimes I think I've forgiven mom, dad, old, blah, 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 blah whoever that was, ex-husband, ex-wife. Um, but then other times I'm just so enraged and whatever, and I realize, no, I haven't forgiven them. Okay, well, a couple things about forgiveness. First of all, um, it would mean hoping this, if you've forgiven, you hope they go to heaven. Do you hope that person goes to heaven? Most people say, yeah, sometimes if they're that hurt and that angry, sometimes they might say, you know what? Since you ask, no. Okay, we'll, we'll start with that then. We need to start praying that God give you the grace, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, hope for that person's salvation. So you've got to start wherever the person is. Um, but, um, oh, so for forgiveness, um, 
Right. You, um, it's never done. It's like um, any other virtue. Mercy, there's a virtue we could say is forgiveness. Um, how about the virtue of being chaste or the virtue of being patient? You know, we don't say, oh, yeah, virtue of patience. You know what? Um, today's uh, Thursday. Two weeks ago last Wednesday, I finished. I'm, I'm patient now. Well, that's good. What about tomorrow? You know, same thing. So that kind of takes the pressure off. Don't worry if you feel like you haven't. Oh, I haven't forgiven that person. Well, some days you're going to be better at, at you know, saying a prayer for them and letting it go. Other days are going to be harder. That's how it is with every virtue. So when it comes to forgiveness in your life, don't put too much pressure like, why aren't I done with it? No. Well, good news and bad news is it's never done. Practice it every day. Pray for that. Jesus said, pray for your uh, persecutors. Love your enemies. Pray for your persecutors. Um, so that's when, back to the exorcist saying, um, that sometimes that can be a door when a person's been hurt very badly, traumatized, abused or something. If they get into a very dark place, and that's hard to avoid, but, um, you know, just build up in themselves hatred and anger and revenge, yeah, that might be attractive to a devil. Again, lots of people do that without ever having been uh, possessed, of course. It's so rare. Um, I'm probably right about it an hour, and... um, yeah, that's, well, no, I'll, I'll finish up in a few minutes here with, um, the, if you're wondering, well, what really happens at an exorcism? Some of the movies there have actually been kind of accurate. It's just what you'd expect. It's some prayers. Um, as one exorcist said, if you read those exor- exorcisms, by the way, in the very narrowest form of the word means I'm speaking to the devil. A prayer is speaking to God, right? I'm speaking to God. Exorcist, the exorcisms in the rite of exorcism, you know, like here's the prayer, um, O Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Eternal God, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, the prayer goes on. Then it says, um, exorcism. I cast thee out, unclean spirit, along with the, you know, and goes on from there. So the one you're addressing, God, prayer, exorcism, you're you're literally speaking to the devil. The old ritual of baptism, which we priests can all use, um, uh, it had what they called minor exorcisms. And why were they called that? Because he was addressing the devil. But you, O devil, depart, for the judgment of God has come. That's great. You actually say that in the in Latin, in the, bapti- in the old baptism ritual. Um, so the rite of baptism has um, those prayers and exorcisms. If you're concerned about the devil in your life or keeping it out of your life, um, you shouldn't do, should not do the rite of exorcism, you should, and neither should I, unless the b- bishop were ever to tell me or Brownsey or any priest, okay, I'm appointing you to do this exorcism. But there are, most, uh, are lots of things in the ritual that we can and should do. So um, the litany of the saints, it starts with the litany of the saints. Oh, great, if you're concerned about... Pray the litany of the saints on a daily basis or when you're particularly worried or whatever. Um, a number of gospels and psalms, without listing them all, the gospels are the ones you'd probably guess, the ones where Jesus is driving out demons. So those are always good to read. Um, oh, no surprise, every good movie would have a crucifix and holy water. Yes, those really are in the rite of exorcism. So obviously have a crucifix in your room. Keep holy water. I keep holy water. I you know, bless myself in the morning and at night and sprinkle a little, you know, I wouldn't worry about, you know, dousing yourself or your house with it. You know, there's some happy medium there. I definitely encourage its use, though. Um, Especially, again, I like the old rituals. Um, The old blessing of holy water specifically said, where this water is sprinkled, may the demons flee in trembling. Um, Same thing with the old ritual, the blessing of candles. Same thing, where this light, may the demons of the air flee. So it was always asking God um, to to drive away demons in in addition to blessing the object. Um, because as a hospital chaplain, um, I'm, around, I'm dealing with a lot of people who are not Catholic on a regular basis and have been for some years. So you have to kind of tone down the, you know, much as I'd love to start preaching the whole Catholic faith, that's not why I'm there to visit a, a sick person and do that the best I can. And if they have, you know, and, and would you like a prayer? And a lot of them do. And I don't generally sprinkle holy water on non-Catholics, but if I know the person's Catholic, I do. But uh, I often do it, up, though, up on that... Uh, on the unit of the mental health unit. I just, I, somehow I feel better sprinkling holy water up there. And when someone asks there, I tell them, well, when I, this is like sprinkling a prayer around because, again, it's the opposite of superstition. When I bless this water, I ask God that wherever I sprinkle this water, may your blessing come and may the devils, the demons flee in trembling. Oh, okay, so what I've already asked God to do, you know, when I'm sprinkling the water, he, I've already asked him in advance what, I'm, what I want to ask him to do by that, by that holy water. Um, so yeah that's the rite of exorcism like I said it's command oh yeah what one exorcist said you know he says you notice that in the exorcisms you spend most of your time insulting the devil um, 
uh, carrier of death, robber of life, shirker of justice, root of all evil, fomenter of vice, seducer of men, traitor of nations, instigator of envy, and that's all in just one part, and I could go on to two others. So you really do spend a lot of time, if you're the exorcist, just insulting the devil. Um, I guess that's the opposite of praise of God, as it should be. Um, so there's the first part of the ritual is those instructions that I was reading from. The second part is um, these, the prayers and exorcisms. Oh, by the way, there's a great... Here's, you want to know how to get, drive away the devil without doing the exorcisms, but another part of the ritual that you can and should do. How about this? This is after all the exorcisms. In addition, it will be very helpful, helpful to say devoutly over and over again, the Our Father, Hail Mary, and the Creed. Oh, it kind of sounds like a rosary. So pray the rosary. It's right there in the, the right of It doesn't say the rosary. It says pray over and over the Our Father, Hail Mary, and Creed. You want to make sure you're safe from the devil. As one exorcist said, uh, it's, this is not rocket science. He said it's uh, uh, a prayer, sacraments, and sacramentals. So say your prayers each day. Pray the rosary. Uh, sprinkle holy water. Go to confession. Um, maybe I'll end with... oh. To, yeah, I will end with one, one more thing. There's a third part of the rite of exorcism added by Pope Leo XIII. That's more for a place or a thing. I think I mentioned that. So if I ever did or, or Monsignor did go to a house, you know, all priests get requested to do that. And I'm not saying that people are imagined it all the time. Maybe they did. Maybe they saw something. All we can do is what we go by is what we see. And I've never gone to a place to bless the house, which is always a good thing to do bless the house. But I've never seen the unexplainable noises or sights or whatever. I'm sure they happen occasionally, but I'm sure they're very rare. And if we ever saw that, we would would report that to the bishop. Hey, I saw things that shouldn't happen. And again, he can appoint someone to do part three of this, which is a, a, a version of the St. Michael prayer that you're familiar with, a little bit different version, and an exorcism telling the devil to get out of this place and sprinkle holy water. Um, last thought. Um, so that you don't think too much about the devil. There was a line from uh, C.S. Lewis, the Screw Tape Letters, a fictional book about the devil. But the devil said, the game is, he's telling one devil advising another. Uh, he said, uh, the game is to get them to be running around with fire extinguishers when there's a flood. So going after the wrong problem. So if all of you here, and I don't know if all of you, but I'm hoping all of you, have a solid prayer life. The basics are, have a solid prayer, take time to pray every day. Not hours, you're, you're not, you know monks and, and nuns cloistered, your students, but take some time to pray every day. Um, go to Mass on the weekend, of course. Um, get to confession regularly. Don't put yourself in the occasions of serious sin where you know, if I go there, I'm probably going to commit a serious sin. Well, then I better not go there. If you're doing those things, then don't, get, don't worry about the devil much. You're already doing the things to keep him away. So if you are doing those things and then worrying about the devil a lot, you would be the one running around with a fire extinguisher and a flood. You're already doing the things. The people in our culture who laugh at the devil, but if they're doing all the wrong things, they're the ones who should actually be concerned. So it's kind of a a two-edged sword. I see the people, sometimes the people who are most concerned about the devil's influence are usually the people who are doing everything right, or most things. I mean, you know, we're going to have our sins, but keep trying to progress in holiness. Uh, The people who laugh at the idea are the ones who think, you know what, You you might really want to think about this stuff. You might be, you should maybe worry. This is bad stuff. Um... You know, the, the Wicca and witchcraft and all that kind of mock, oh, those are silly Christian things. And I, Oh, gosh, okay, what can you say? Um, you know, I wouldn't do that if I was you. Um, I think that's everything I have for tonight. And I've probably gone about an hour or so. Um, please, yeah, I'm going to take a, a drink here and... associated with the demons or the devil. How common is it that the average Catholic Christian has envy in their heart, and how do they identify it and combat it? I've just seen that as kind of a problem. And wow, that's pretty s- subtle. Um, why the devil? St. Thomas would say the devil's first sin was pride. Um, 
some some way of saying, um, I, well, what did the prophet Isaiah? I want, I will be, I will ascend above the heavens. I will be like the Most High. So in some way, the devil wanted to be like God in some way that he wasn't supposed to be and was trying to claim that. So Saint Thomas would say that was his first sin. Then he would say the next one um, would be envy of. Uh, so why bother Adam and Eve? Okay, you're in hell, but why about envy? Because they're going to be with him and I'm not. So that's why that would probably. I presume that's why it'd be called the sin of the devil. Aquinas would say that was the one after pride was was envy of of the human race because we. He can be with God, and he can't ever. Um, so that's where his envy would be. Wow, for us, I think envy is uh, probably so subtle. Um, but if we look at that as the definition of it, why do I... It's okay to want justice, isn't it? Someone does something wrong to me. Is it okay to want justice? Sure. Someone, uh, whatever, uh, robs my house. Uh, yeah, I hope they get some kind of punishment for it. That's fair. Um, Jesus said, don't, you know, be a little careful with that. The measure you measure with will be measured back to you. So if I want God to be some, some mercy on me, I should also want God to have some mercy on, on this person. But there's a, it's okay, like, to want justice. Someone does something really bad. But we have to be careful. When does, I, I guess that would, I would be afraid of, of wanting too much justice and revenge. And then it can kind of be envy um, because I, uh, uh if that, I don't like the person at work, let's say. Well, maybe then I'm, I'm envious. Anything good that happens to them, anything they accomplish at work, or whatever, I don't like it. Why? Because whatever, fill in the blank, whatever, whatever reason I have, it's still bad to envy them, to dislike the good that they are going to get. That's, keep that in mind. If you need a kind of a, a definition, devil with Adam and Eve. Okay, so you're in hell. Why you know, take it? Well, because I don't want them having some good that I don't have. So B, that's how you can identify it. Do I not want them getting something good just because I don't get it? That's not good reasoning. If I want justice, okay, that's another story. But I guess I would look to that one, the, the devil and Adam and Eve. Yeah, I don't, want, I don't get it, so I don't want them to get it either. Um, in, the, in Deuteronomy, it tells about not interpreting dreams, but that's not what you're talking about, right? That's kind of a um, dream interpretation is like reading tea leaves. It's kind of nonsense. Not that, um, you know, someone goes through a, a terrible trauma, you know, a soldier coming back from the war, they can have terrible dreams. That, that's not interpreting it. That's like, oh, flashback, you know, during their sleep or whatever. Um, but you are talking about the devil in a person's dreams. Um, yeah, it seems like the devil can do that, but we don't want to, again, um, automatically go there because we can just have a dream about the devil that he didn't instigate. But could he? Um, it seems like maybe. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. I should mention something I forgot. When I said the devil um, cannot read our mind, but he can put images in our mind. And if that seems frightening, you know, well, keep in mind, uh, when you leave here, you might uh, see uh, ads on your computer, uh, billboards, uh, everywhere we go, we're seeing someone's putting images in our mind, right? Pick, trying to give us ideas. So the devil does it too. He's just one more. He just does it in a non-physical way. And how is that? I don't know, but some spiritual way. Um, so could he do that in our dreams? It seems, it seems that he could. Some, some exorcists would say that, yeah, that's, that can be, um, we get back into the two the more wide approach and the narrow approach. There would be exorcists who would say, see, that's, I'm going to take that as a sign, as one part of a sign of this person being possessed. I would more follow those exorcists say, ah, maybe, maybe not. That's not concrete enough. Um, the person could just be having a dream about a devil. Um, so you fall back on the same, um, what, are you do, what is the rest of your, li- your spiritual life? You know, are, are you doing anything to provoke this? As long as you're saying your prayers, um, you know, sacraments, sacramentals, and don't watch scary movies before going to bed because that's, you know, and that's not to make fun. That's like, to, that's one of the questions I would ask someone. Well, what are you doing before you go into bed? Are you reading a book about the devil? You're reading that stupid book that priest wrote about the demons or something? <laughs> joke. Um, so that you would want to find out all those things. But if it's part of a package, I guess, of, wow, this person seems to be possessed, then maybe they'd have dreams about the demons too. So bottom line is you don't know. Yes, he can, though, because he can give us images. That's, that's very clear um, that he can put images in our mind. And that's not terribly creepy because so can every radio, TV, and billboard put an image in our mind too.
Did that answer your question? Uh-oh. Monsignor Brown, he has a question. Please correct it. Correct if I said something wrong. Thank, that's great. That's great advice. And that's when, that's when we get to those ones that maybe are some higher level. When, that do, when the devil doesn't seem to leave alone, we'd say, wow, then something. But that something could just be a more severe mental or emotional problem, too. But that's great advice. I love the Nike analogy. Yeah. I don't have to do that. He can't force it. That's what, that's what possession is, where he's literally forcing a person's body. And that is, you know, if I ask for a show of hands, how many have seen that? Probably none of us. So that's how rare it is uh, for possession. So, yeah, he's rarely forcing us, just putting the idea. I love that. Uh, just don't buy the Nikes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you said in the rite of exorcism, they use holy water, crucifix, and prayers. But what exactly about those things would expel a demon from a person? Great, thank you. So, oh, gosh, that's why I like having question and answer times because I see all the things. Oh, that was pretty important that I left out. Um, because it comes from the church, that's what makes it. This one is from 1614. Um, a new ritual came out in 1999, so the first revision in so many years. And it was quickly revised a few years later, and none of the exorcists uh, that I've talked to want to use it. And they don't have to. They can still use the old one. Because it's too... <laughs> <laughs> it's almost too polite, they say. Um, this one is more authoritative, like insulting the devil all this time. But uh, um, one exorcist said that another exorcist said, so this is, the exorcist is grapevine. No, I like to talk to these guys because I, I learn about this topic. Um, but um, he said, oh, yeah, I talk, this one exorcist told me, yeah, when I was doing the exorcism, and, the, and he apparently using the newer ritual from 1999, and the demon said, you're not trying to get rid of me with that useless thing, are you? And the exorcist was talking to me. He said, well, I told him he said that, and you believed him? <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, um, even if the, uh, this one, I, if I were doing it, I'd like this one, insulting the devil and stuff. But what gives it the power is um, the power of the church, uh, the flip side of what makes um, the, uh, the words of consecration in the Mass change slightly in English. Uh, five years ago, Monsignor, ten, time goes by, we're getting old. Um, just yeah, five or ten years ago, what makes, how do those words change the bread and wine in Jesus' body and blood because the church says they do. So purely the authority of the church. So um, the, the holy water, well, what makes it different? I fill it out, we have a thing at the hospital and, when, and the people in the cafeteria once or twice, that's it? That's all your holy water is? Because they see me filling up with the thing there. I say, well, I bless it. No, it is just tap water. It's not like we get it from a special spring. It's the power of the church bless it, saying the blessing. Um, what else did you say? Crucifix, you know, the image of Christ. Somehow the devil hates that. And then if we bless the crucifix, all the more so. Um, the, rit- the whole ritual itself is because it's authorized by the church. So that's a great question. Keep that in mind. It's the authority of the church. Why, like I said, the, the exorcist is not some guy who happened to be bound, born with some superpower. Um, as one exorcist said, he said, yeah, maybe I should be wearing a, a cape and a red a, a E on my chest for exorcist. Um, there's none of that. It's that the bishop has appointed him. Oh, now instead of uh, Father John Doe, um, you know, doing this, uh, I've never, of all the sins priests commit, I've never heard a priest being so stupid as to do, try and do an exorcism without the authority. Um, Okay, the, the devil who's, the, who is who he is because of disobedience. And so as a priest, I'm going to take him on by being disobedient. I don't think that's going to go well. I've never heard of a priest being so foolish. Um, but once the de- bishop says, I'm giving you authority, oh, now it doesn't matter which Father John Doe it is. Actually, it does matter. I'd rather have a holy priest than one who's not doing so well. That right actually says that, by the way. Um, did that answer your question about that, though, that it's the authority of the church? I should mention that. Um, start the, the instructions start out by saying a priest, one who is expressly and, and especially authorized by the ordinary bishop. So um, he should be whatever, piety, prudence, integrity of life, um, humility. So it names good things a priest should have. So that is why, by the way, um, 
You know the uh, anointing of, is it okay if I go off on tangents like this? The anointing of the sick. Um, you know, we know that other, there have been certainly uh, saints who can have done miraculous healings, right? That without doing the anointing of the sick, and maybe a man or a woman, saint either way. Um, so the, God's uh, miraculous healings aren't just confined to the anointing of the sick. He can do it through anyone who, who wants. As average Joe priest who is not a saint, uh, that's the way I'm supposed to you know, pray for healing and, and for grace and forgiveness. Um, same thing with exorcism. Um, there have been a couple, I'm thinking, uh, uh, St. Hildegard van Bingen, a neat, amazing woman, wherever she lived, 1300s. Um, amazing music. Oh, she was great. Um, but she had, so apparently was driving out demons. Um, uh, St. Margaret of Antioch, back in the, around the 3rd century martyr, she was said to have power to drive out demons. So God can drive out demons from whatever person he wants, whatever holy person. But if you're a bishop with, you know, I don't know, how many, how many priests, saints do we have? Not enough, Monsignor, do we? So if he doesn't have a saint, he'll just pick a priest and say, okay, I'm going to give you the authority of the church. Um, and so that's what the rite is doing. It's the power of the church. Through those traditional things, gospels, psalms, crucifix, holy water. Related yeah. question. Yeah. Um, the sacramentals, the rites, are given power through the church. Um, so those anti-sacramentals, things like amulets, things yeah. like that, only, like, kind of like you said, only have the power that is to deceive and nothing beyond that for the most part? Yeah, except that they do seem to get some... The devil seems to attach to things. Are you familiar with uh, the story of... Um Definitely deception is always part of it, but the devil really does seem to attach to particular persons when they're possessed. Um, to uh, Remember the, the, gar- the uh, demon-possessed man at Gerasen? You're familiar with that? When Jeevo, uh, Jesus comes in this guy, it says he's breaking. Right, we see the signs of possession. He sees Jesus. He knows who Jesus is right away and runs up to him. Okay, how did he know that? You know, okay, there's one sign of possession. He kept breaking shackles and chains. Okay, this guy's really possessed. And uh, so devil, Jesus, you know, tells the devils, and they say uh, they pleaded hard for Jesus not to drive them from that district. What? They liked this area? That's what the gospel says. Why do they like that area? Who knows why? And then they're so weird. Well, put us into the pigs. And Jesus says, out with you. And they go into the pigs, and the pigs run off and drown. Does that ring a bell with most of you? Um, it doesn't that sound like it's a very unusual description of possession from the gospels. It's from the gospels, so I believe it's absolutely true. It's just interesting how strange it is um, compared to the others. But something, they, were, they pleaded hard not to be driven from that district. They liked the place for some reason, whatever. Who knows why? Who knows why they possess a particular person? Who knows why they stick on this particular, back to your question, this particular charm or amulet? But it seems like they must because the ritual says to burn it. So, um, but the thing, there aren't things that inherently, I was hearing someone saying, well, sage is used in uh, whatever, some pagan and Wicca rituals and that, so you shouldn't burn sage. Well, I don't know. Is sage, I, don't, I th- think it's a different one than I put in my spaghetti sauce, but it's, the, the sage isn't inherently bad. Just because someone else uses it for a bad thing still doesn't make it inherently bad. Um, uh, like I said, an altar and a chalice are used by Satanists. Well, that doesn't make it inherently bad. I'm going to keep using an altar and chalice for good things. So, but there is something about, if something has been used for terrible evil, sometimes a devil can attach to it, apparently a place, because that's why there's chapter 3 of that ritual, apparently a, a small object, that's why the ritual says to burn it. So somehow the devil can get it. It didn't have an inherent, a Ouija board is uh, wood and paper and plastic. I mean, when it's cranked out at the factory, it's not bad. But it only has one purpose that I know of, and, you know, and that is to do bad things with it. So, it, um, I've heard some kind of talk about what I would call the, the, uh, the medical model, and I wouldn't go by that. I wouldn't worry about picking up a demon by being in the wrong place at the wrong time, other than occasions of sin. But just, you know, it, it's, it's not like germs. He's not going to rub off on you. If I, if someone accident, if someone, if I accidentally touched something, I didn't know that this thing had been used in whatever Wicca ceremony or something. I don't worry about. Oh shoot, 
demon, darn it. You know, not that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't really, I've heard some that really say you don't want to touch that. Well, I don't know. If I was worried about it, you know what I would do? I would, I would make a sign of the cross with holy water and say the holy water is stronger than that stupid object, even if the devil is attached to it. So I'm not discounting it. It's just that we've got to believe that God is stronger, so use your holy water to counteract it, and that's the end of it. I would also not follow the, um, the legal model. I've heard this one. Well, the devil... It's, he gets a legal right to be, wait, where did the devil get a legal, the devil has no legal right of anything except to go to hell. So I'm kind of careful about that. I, I think the thing to always go back to is the personal relationship, the mockery. Okay, we're supposed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When I'm doing evil, I'm building up a personal relationship uh, with the devil. Okay, bad. That's, so always fall back on the relationship, just like we don't want to... Um, think of God as in just a legal relationship with God. Well, there is that, God's laws, but we want to, and absolutely there are God's laws, but we want to say we love him too, right? And so more than that. So we don't want to just say, well, the devil's got these legal rights. Eh, it's more of building a relationship with him. More than answer each question. Someone had their hand up. Uh, yes. Yeah. There's a wide range on that, um, whether a child can be possessed. Uh, the, um, the exorcists who are more the narrow approach and need more concrete, they'll generally tell me never seen a devil, uh, child possessed because of what I was just saying, because a child doesn't build up a personal relationship. Um, uh, others would say they think so, and there is a one gospel there, too, and we can't ignore the gospels. Maybe things have changed since the time of Christ. I'm kind of uncomfortable saying that because why would things just change? Certainly, Jesus seemed to drive out a lot more. I mean, they were seeing demon-possessed people a fair amount then, and we don't see him at all. Something changed when Jesus came into the world. Surprise, surprise. Um, but he was. But there is one gospel reading where it says a young boy, and the father and Jesus says, "How long has this been happening? Since he was a child." We don't get an age there, so was he a 12-year-old or 13-year-old child who had dabbled or something? Who knows? Um, so I'd like to say, no, that can't happen, but um, I can't be, I, I'm not, I don't have a, uh, a right to say that, other than, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of any of the exorcists. Who's, some of them think that, yeah, if your parents are in some, if you were born and dedicated to Satan in some ceremony as a child, um, that you could be possessed. It certainly wouldn't be a good thing. Um, so I don't have an answer for you, other than I like to believe the exorcists who say, never seen it, they don't believe it. Sure, it can cause problems for a child, obviously, but um, just what you said seems to make sense. How would a devil possess a child? But there is that one in the gospel. How old was that child? We don't know. Maybe it was a teenager who had been doing some bad things. Great question. I don't have an answer for Um, maybe falling back to Monsignor's thing, I think his power over us is limited to what we give to him. I mean, his power in the world is what it is. It's a lot. Um, but that's because a lot of people aren't and back to doing the, the right things. But if you're, yeah, how much power can he have over you if you are praying daily, going to confession regularly, avoiding occasions of sin? I don't see him having much power. But he's going to have power in the world, certainly. It's interesting to see how he grows from that little whispering snake in the garden and how does the devil appear in the book of revelation a huge dragon so yeah he's he's going to be more powerful at the end or showing his power more at the end more open he's going to definitely have power but over us as individuals god is stronger keep up the relationship with god and and follow his laws and i don't see how he'd have much power over you at all keep he'll keep trying I can't remember what. What do you mean? What do you mean by provoking experience? I, um, I'm sorry. What I can't remember what I said exactly. By that, did I mean some like, of the? Uh, like with the whole thing with like objects or. or like yeah. Yeah, dabbling. Like that, yeah. 
Right. Well, the, yeah, those are violations of the first commandment. Um, so maybe the worst, maybe the best way to try and build a relationship with the devil is to violate that one. You know, that's the book of Deuteronomy. I can't tell you chapter and verse where it's absolutely, for, you know, remember when God banished the you know, magic sorcerers, all those kind of things. So, yeah, that's... That's inviting. Uh, it seems, it's, it sounded like you answered your own question because then you are giving him power over you. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Then you're not doing the right things. Yeah. Sorry. Did that? Did I follow you? And did I yeah. answer? Yeah. You know, definitely any of those. Once we want to put our trust in something other than God, um, some spiritual power other than God. Um, yeah, that's a bad, a bad path. Yes. That's where you'd get uh, I'd, uh, you'd get some disagreement. I kind of just don't. I kind of follow the ones who say who, the exorcists and, and those who would just say. I can't find anywhere in church teaching or the writings of saints that say that is going to affect you when you're upstairs or downstairs or whatever. That's kind of what I was talking about the medical kind of the contamination view of demons. And I don't really think that. I don't see that in the writings of saints. I don't see the catechism warning you to check out the neighbors to see if they're, you know, that kind of thing. There are some exorcists that I and, and uh, that I just think they're mis- mistaken on that. There's a difference of can be difference of opinion um, that they would say, yeah, beware. I don't know. I'd say sprinkle holy water. You know, it's the same thing. So you get some difference of opinion, but I can't find any saint or any church teaching that says that's a danger to you. It's like I have nothing. You know, we can only control so much. I wouldn't worry about it at all. Again, as long as you use your holy water, go to Mass, go to confession. Oh, I'm sorry to hear, say your prayers for those people doing that, if you know of any. Yeah. Um, two questions, one really quick. How many exorcists are in the United States? And then two, how much does um, demons, deliverance, all that stuff have to do with the abortion industry? I've heard that you know, abortion and demonic stuff are pretty closely associated. Um, how many in the United States? You know, I think um, as recently as maybe 10, 10 or 15 years ago, there might have been only been a few. And um, Pope Benedict it was encouraging more exorcists. And the American bishops at one of their conferences um, talked about it and talked about having more. And um, so um, there are now, I think, maybe 50 or more. The last time one of them told me that a lot more dioceses, maybe even more than that, or around that, was when one exorcist said he was trying to kind of have a list of the names and numbers that they would keep amongst themselves just for purpose of whatever, consulting, getting together, whatever. So maybe about that many. And what was the second like how question? Much, how much does abortion have to do with abortion? You know, I've heard those stories, too. I don't know. Um, you know, isn't it, uh, isn't it sick but interesting that, um, you know, a pagan thing of, you know, we've got good gods and bad gods, good forces and bad forces out there. So you want the good ones on your side, and the bad ones, you kind of want to appease them. So the good ones, hey, I'll offer good sacrifice and stuff to whatever good gods I believe. And the bad ones, historically, different hist- place in history, different cultures, people seem to think the bad ones like, uh, you know, child sacrifice. So you see it in the Old Testament, God saying how I never, you know, never conceived of such a thing when the Israelites started following that. Um, so there's some connection there with you know, false worship of, of false gods and that. But how much demon possession, I don't know. You know, I read some story, kind of not even a story, it was just a parable, someone walking down a road um, and seeing a, a monastery uh, or a convent, whichever it was, and all the priests or all the sisters, whichever it was, were all very good and holy and doing what they should. And, and um, there were demons all over trying to tempt them because, you know, they were so good. And then keeps, well, a person keeps walking along and sees whatever it was, a different convent, where they're not following the rule at all and not saying the prayers and whatever. And there's one demon just standing by the door, kind of whatever, bored or whatever. Point being of the parable, um, sometimes I wonder if the devil's really hard at work. And sometimes I wonder if he's just stepping back laughing at our culture because we've got so many people intent on doing such evil. It's like... Psh- Hey, get out of the, I'm getting out of their way. They seem to be, do a fine job of, of heading down the path to hell without me, you know, mixing it up. Some question that about uh, possession, that why would the devil possess someone anyway? Even the movie can be scary enough. Apparently the real thing, which I've not seen, can be really terrifying. Um, 
And the answer seems to be when he gets a chance, he just can't help himself, so he'll do it anyway. But it can be an instrument for good. That's, again, a couple extras said, oh, you know, people who generally possess and genuinely want to get, you know, come to an exorcist, and he said they are usually on a good path after that. I mean, scare the hell out of them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we should have had you doing that all night, but I, I didn't have enough bad jokes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So you talk a lot about like the burden of proof. Is there? Yeah. Yeah. Is, so like, is a false positive, false positive <laughs> exorcism like a, is that a bad thing? Can you not be like better safe than sorry? Yeah. No. Oh, right. Thank you. These guys. These are great questions because then it, um, I have a degree in counseling and I visit on you know most days of the week um, a mental health unit. I can't think of a worse thing to do when some of these people with schizophrenia, who someone talked about demon dreams, who have dreams about demons or hear demons or see them. I can't think of anything worse to say, well, you know what, there's a chance it could be possessed and I better do an exorcism. I've just reinforced it for this person who probably, is the devil bothering them? Absolutely, I know he is, because I know he's bothering everyone. And I tell them that, because I don't, you know, they say, and you won't, you won't believe this. Oh, I believe the devil's bothering you. Sure, and so we talk about that, and then that's an opening for evangelizing. Are you saying your prayers? And so I can talk about that. This is how to drive the devil away. But then I also say, they know they're on a mental health unit in those cases, so that's an easy one. I, I can say, well, you know, you're on this floor. Are you talking to a counselor, talking to a doctor? Because that could be part of this, too. Um, but yeah, that's the problem with that. I do not want to confirm for drive into someone even more so if I haven't seen anything other than schizophrenia, which is bad enough. And then to tell the poor person with schizophrenia, say, yeah, I saw a priest. He was sure I had demons in me. Oh, no. So that's the problem. I'm glad you asked it because that's the problem I have with the exorcists who I think are a little bit too, use it a little too freely. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's the problem with that that you can reinforce it. That's, that's why, uh, you know, the counseling field has gone off the deep end as a whole, um, but that doesn't mean every individual counselor. But I, I can see how, the, you know, good secular counselors would say, you've got to be kidding me. you got a person with schizophrenia, and you just, you know, told them they had demons in them. Now what am I going to, how am I going to counsel them? Because you didn't do them any good, because they didn't show any, you know, even according to your own thing, they didn't show signs. So that's the, that's the danger of that. Great question, because that bounces back. To, that's why... Uh, way back in 1614, they said, distinguish it from psychological disorders. False positive. I've never heard it put that way from possession. That's great. <laughs> uh, yes? So you said that the authority to be an exorcist comes from the bishop. Right. So would that mean that a bishop could perform an exorcism themselves whenever they deem it necessary? Great question. I'm trying to think of which uh, one of the exorcists said. I think bishops should do more exorcisms themselves. Yes, a bishop by his... Um, and, by the way, though, the, um, the ordinary. So uh, we had at one time in our bishop, we had... In our bishop, in our diocese, we had the bishop and we had a, a coadjutor bishop, so an assistant bishop for a while um, when I was in the seminary. Um, the ordinary would be the, full, the bishop. So he's the one who has the authority. So the other one shouldn't do it. We're getting technical now. But yes, every ordinary, the bishop of the territory, has the authority to do an exorcism in his territory. Great question. And yes, they absolutely do. Um, and uh, like I said, one exorcist I remember saying, I wish bishops would do it more themselves. Uh, somehow I think there'd be more power from a bishop. I don't know. But anyway, yes, absolutely, the bishop can. He can appoint it. He can make himself. He's a priest of his diocese. But I've never heard of any of them doing it. It's probably, uh, probably, I'm guessing, their sense of humility. They're saying, oh, I'll have someone else do it, you know? Yeah. Also, most bishops are not good at literature. They get it wrong, probably. <laughs> What's that? Most bishops are not good at literature. They oh. <laughs> they'd, have the, they'd have to have the whole uh, MC there <laughs> to help them with the ritual. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I wish there were more. I, these have been all great questions because they've. I try not to just read the whole thing and have just some outline there. So I'm glad you're bringing up points. Do you know of any like is there any? I shouldn't call them famous, but like, is there any well-known exorcisms that you studied or that you like have a lot of knowledge about? Um, <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, that might. And in fact. Another great question, because when the, it's giving the instructions about the exorcist, it says um, he should resort to a great deal more study of this matter by examining approved authors and cases from experience. So you should try and find those. Um, the one that the movie The Exorcist was 
um, made from was an actual case of a, a the movie was a young girl the real case was a young boy apparently playing with a Ouija board that is uh, with his grandmother or aunt or something so it was a young person back to that question about a young, young people it was may I can't remember if the boy's like 10 or 12 years old but apparently that was enough to get him possessed it's very debatable um, but they moved from Washington to St. Louis yes yeah, so you can read about that one I mean, there are a couple books on the matter I'm always like a skeptic one exorcist said exorcist trained as a skeptic so I try and follow his advice. So I don't know how much of those books were accurate, um, but that case, um, there was one in Iowa. There's a book about that. I can't uh, say uh, something like Satan Be Gone. You might find that online. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, oh, that, that movie Emily Rose, Exorcism of Emily Rose. Um, that one, again, you didn't quite see the full signs of possession, including how did she get possessed, but... Um, that was based on a, 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 a true story from Germany um, that a sociologist, who was probably not Catholic, but wrote a good... Sociologists sometimes write really good objective things because they're wanting to know what is this culture like. So they try to be very objective and report what they see and heard and what the people explained. And one of them wrote a book about the case of possession that that movie, Exorcism of Emily Rose, was based on. So, yeah, I've... Uh, and then I've read, a, I've read a lot in my dissertation... doing my dissertation. Don't know if they're true or not. A number of things from other cultures, the Catholic cases, the... Um, how true is what I'm reading? So I'd always, again, that's probably why I'm a skeptic, too, because I'm reporting this in a dissertation. I've got to say, here's the author. I don't know, you know, critique their, critique their reliability. Uh, not criticize, but critique. Yes, right from the right. The priest should try and read those things. The exorcist should. Yes. Are you Freudian psychologist? I didn't mean to insult anyone. <laughs> okay. I'm just curious with um, kind of the modern diagnosis of mentally um, mental illness and your allusion to uh, schizophrenia, which I don't understand the gamut of the whole thing, but like when I think of you're putting a label on something, calling it schizophrenia, where in my mind, any time somebody back in like the scriptures or biblical times would have been, they would have labeled it something else, probably closer to demonic possession. So I don't know. How are you making the divide between like psychological ailments that are commonly labeled and what is quote unquote real demon possession? I don't know. Like, where is that? Um, you've got to use a great word, label. Keep in mind that with modern medical, uh, when we call something in mental health or a diagnosis, the, we sh- it's not really. When someone comes to the emergency room in the hospital and, oh, my back is hurting so badly. Okay, well, diagnosis. Uh, maybe the doctor does an x-ray. Oh, you've got a fracture. Or maybe he says, no, not a fracture. It looks like a pulled muscle. Or, oh, my gosh, you've got a kidney stone. So we're looking for the, the diagnosis. What is causing your pain? But with you nailed it. When it comes to mental health things, hey, I have been sad for two months, sadder than I'm used to being. I, I'm sleeping so much. I'm always tired. Um, I'm not hungry. I've lost my... Hey, you've just named three signs of depression. You, you've got depression. Well, they didn't find any cause. They put a label on this group of... of problems. That's okay as long as we know that's all they're doing. And then we can go from there and see if we find a cause. But label is what mental health diagnoses are. So yes, we did, and the labels change every 15 years in the United States with the DSM, literally every 15 years. Um, but having said that, um, um, possession, back to the basics, the devil is possessing, is moving this person's body and vocal cords. This people with schizophrenia that I see, there's nothing to indicate that. The devil could be bothering them mentally more so than he is the rest of us. That certainly could be the case, and um, and it could also be the case though that they just have a, uh, that their intellect isn't working properly. And how do we know? I would say we don't. Um, I actually once after a talk like this um, had a woman come up. She was a, a, a district attorney, state's attorney, whatever, and said, "Why is it that?" Most of these cases I have when they, you know, a person is committed to a crime and they're just you know, all over the place, you know, schizophrenic, crazy, whatever word she used, why are they always talking about demons, seeing demons? And I said, well, you know, sometimes they think it's the CIA, and I've seen that one in our hospital, and CIA is following me. Sometimes they think it's uh, aliens. You know, aliens are putting thoughts in my head. And she just shook her head. She said, 99% of the time it's demons. Why is it always demons? And ever since then, I've kind of thought, it probably is. Not possession. But, again, the, de- the pitchfork. The devil is jabbing a person's weak point. What's he going to do to a person with schizophrenia? I presume he might 
fill him with ideas of demons. Who's going to believe him? You know? So I think it's both. I think schizophrenia is a real thing. I don't think it's just a demon causing that. Um, because we, we know it can be from, you know, uh, just a human original sin, the damage done to the intellect through original sin. Um, but these aren't mutually exclusive. It can be both. Would you imagine that most people that are experiencing demonic possessions in our culture would end up in psychiatric wards? One exorcist said that uh, to look for the... the the, the, the thing that, wow, they, they're, show, they're not showing other signs of, of mental health problems. Although, one exorcist, and when I asked one exorcist, how many of the people you've done exorcisms on, how many do you think also had mental health problems? He said, oh, all of them. And it's not like he's a cautious one. In 20 years, he's done five or six, I think. It's not like he's doing buckets of them. Um, so, I'm sorry, you question the... Uh, you Oh, boy! I don't. I don't know. Uh, and keeping in mind, we don't have too much of long-term um, mental health facilities in the country. It's usually so we don't have that much. Would they end up in the hospital occasionally? Would I see them? Probably. Um, which is why, I, uh, like I said, I sprinkle holy water on that floor pretty much every day. You know, just as a blessing. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that, I guess. that um, Yeah, they'd probably at least be suspected of it, but locked away for a long time, probably not, because we don't even have that much anymore, and we need it. That's a tough one. You know, it goes back and forth historically between too easy to confine people, so, uh, so a couple people don't like me, so they report that I'm crazy. Next thing I know, I'm locked up for 20 years in a mental health asylum because two people didn't like me. We don't want it to be that easy. On the other hand, we've got some poor woman... Uh, wandering around one of the towns I'm in and another town nearby, and she's talking to herself and hanging out in the parks and doesn't want help and just it, it just tears your heart out. Yeah. Slowing down? Oh, yes. Uh, do you have an opinion on, there's a passage of Luke here, uh, Luke 9, 49, and John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and you tried to hinder him. We, that was just Sunday's gospel, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess the disciples were, you know, concerned that there were people that were not with them that were casting out demons. Um, does that have an application today? Uh, boy, I, I, don't, I don't think so because, um, <laughs> because Jesus said it was okay for him, so it was okay, you know, in that case. But um, the... Yeah, I don't know how that would apply today. That's, I, I thought of that, believe me, over the weekend reading that. Like, yeah, what, what does that mean for us today? I don't think it means just let anyone who wants to go around doing that. The reason, by the way, I said the printing press, but another reason why this was kind of codified was because in the Middle Ages, you know, 13, 14 hours, there were times when, just to, when you didn't need a bishop's authority, by the way. And so lots of priests doing too many, you know, seeing demons everywhere, and then witches, and you got witch hunts that were false. Not as bad as the history books say, but it was bad enough that the church said, uh, okay, from now on, we've got a, a ritual here to follow, a bishop's approval. So I would go by the authority of the church rather than um, try and come up with an interpretation of that. But that is a great question again. Well, so, uh, like you said, but at the end of that, when he says, he was not, with, he was not against you, it was for you. Uh, you don't see that as like a general, maybe there are other people that were, so like at least at that time, Oh, oh right, 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 right up until the right up until like the 1600s, and and well, and that's a great point too because until the church said, keep in mind the the authority of the church. So that until the church said, wait, this is out of hand. This is becoming a circus. Too many people doing exorcisms that aren't real exorcisms. So now you need a bishop to approve it. But before that, if you didn't need a bishop to approve it, then you were you were okay doing it. It might have been, you might have been using bad judgment, but you weren't doing something against the authority of the church. So that would have to develop with the church. But certainly at that time, Jesus said it was okay. And then yet you get the Acts of the Apostles, where the Jewish exorcists used Jesus' names and the de- devil you know, beat up on him. Do you remember that one? Read the Acts of the Apostles. And um, uh, some Jewish exorcists invo- uh, 
driving out a demon in Jesus' name. And the demon, and something about Paul, he says, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but I don't know you. And then he, the man attacks them and beats them up. So um, it's kind of almost like, I don't want to say contradicting that one, but showing there's some limit to that, that not anyone should just say Jesus' name and do an exorcism. What about non-Catholic exorcists? It would depend on their sincerity, you know. Um, you know, I've, I've certainly met Protestant ministers who are doing that. Certainly any Catholic can pray for the, again, prayer for the devil to be driven away. So maybe that's it. This limits this ritual to priests. But there's not only nothing against, but certainly everyone should be saying the rosary and the holy water and all those good things. So we could look at it that way too. Okay, just don't use this ritual, but certainly do your prayers to drive out demons. And if you've got the power to do it, like uh, Margaret of, of Antioch and uh, Hildegard van Bingen, hey, do it, you know.